Hi, I'm Reed Kroloff of Jones Kroloff. Lighting is such an important issue for all of us in the design world. Please join me now for a conversation about new opportunities that are technology driven for moving lighting design ever closer to a human centric model. Glad you could join us today. Let's jump right into the question at hand, which is the issue of human centric lighting. And I'd just like to start and ask, what, is that, what does that term mean to you, Vivian? What is human-centric lighting? OK, so I get the you get privilege of going first. You right? do. OK, you so do. Um, I, I'd like to introduce two terms uh, in discussing, discussing human-centric lighting. The first term would be biophilia, and the second term would be activity-based. Um, it strikes me that two things that we have been missing in the lighting design world and um, is the power of daylight as a critical contribution to the lighting world. Uh, and a lot of research is now beginning to emerge about the importance of circadian light and the importance of views and daylight, which varies across the time of day. Uh, so it's very clear to me that quality lighting now is going to embrace very, very fully, uh, and human-centric is going to uh, embrace the issues of biophilia and nature and natural lighting uh, conditions. Uh, the second variable I'd like to introduce is activity-based lighting. We have been providing very uniform, relatively high-level lighting throughout our work and our study and our, and our retail environments without much variability. In fact, there's actually disdain the notion of a variable lighting condition in, in most office planning. And the reaction to that is that people now work in computers for probably two-thirds, if not a majority of their time, under very high light levels. And they often uh, look at paper-based tasks very infrequently. And then they have a lot of time on the phones and in meetings. And there's actually a critical need to rethink the way in which um, our lighting is actually much more conducive to the tasks at hand, which often means we have to let humans back into the loop and let them control the light levels. So when you're talking about, when you say that, that last comment about letting human control, humans control the lighting levels, in a way, human-centric design, it, it takes on at least one dimension, which is humans having more control over their lighting on a day-to-day -day basis, rather than just on or off. That's right. Um, you not only need to control, in many cases, the, the light levels, but to where, what the light is actually lighting. You know, in terms of activity-centric, sometimes you need things to light a vertical surface because you're using whiteboards collectively. Sometimes you need it to light a horizontal surface. Sometimes you need it to actually just provide enough lighting for you to be comfortable on the phone and, uh, or in a classroom to see the faces of, of the occupants. I just want to emphasize that biophilia is actually a critical human-centric issue as well, in addition to control. Uh, because humans do have, and, and the work of Eric Fromm and then E.O. Wilson and Stephen Kellert at Harvard, Yale, and, and all the, the, the top universities have, have begun to show that humans have a huge inherent need for connection to nature. And uh, nature includes the circadian qualities of light and the, the, the variation in frequency and, and, uh, and levels. And so I think it turns out if we're going to be human-centric, we're going to be biophilic. Yeah, I want, to, I want to go back to one of the things you said that was very interesting, actually. You say you know, task-based lighting, right? Lighting for the task at hand, um, providing individualization for your lighting systems. It's not just about the tasks that we're doing, too, right? It's about our mood. It's about our energy. It's about, you know, how do I feel today? I, I might want a different lighting environment based on when I'm a happy person or when I'm, you know, focused or when I want to be energized. And, and so ch being able to change my lighting in my environment is really important based on my mood, based on my task, based on what I want my social experience to be, right? Am I, am I feeling social? Am I feeling, you know, kind of personal and private? And so having the ability to control your light based on more than your tasks, including your mood and other social experiences, is is very important to human-centric lighting. And how does each generation want to control their environment? Is it a switch? Is it an iPad? Is it, you know, do they want to talk to the room and have the room adapt, right? So it's not just it happens. You actually have to bring that into design to be able to get that right for the users. Well, in addition to the mood, I would add the generations that attend these facilities. You have baby boomers, X, millennials, and now centennials. So you need to design for that the needs and the activities of all these generations are very different. As a design, design professional, often I think of it in, as a three-legged stool. One is uh, visual performance. How well am I performing my task, whether it's uh, uh, staring at a computer screen or writing something on a piece of paper or walking down the street. So that's a performance attribute. Uh, a second is what effect it has on my well-being. Uh, whether it's the circadian rhythms or uh, some other sort of visual or non-visual 
aspect of my life. And I think the third, and we've heard it several times as well, is what does it do for me psychologically? Um, I, if, you, if you look to the theater, you see great examples of this. You'll have a set on a theater stage. And lighting is critical to establishing the mood, the emotion, uh, uh, reinforcing what the actors will say and how they'll perform. And in, as silly as this might sound, that's in essence what we do as lighting designers is you know, who are our actors? How, what are they going to be performing? What are their needs? How do we reinforce that experience? In this case, for the audience. We want the audience to feel that the scene is believable. And, and, and So if you think about all those, ultimately we roll them all back together and have to create a, a common um, lighting design that fulfills those needs as much as possible. Whether one calls it human-centric, I think it's just being sensitive to um, uh, human needs and human uh, desires as part of what we can provide for people, whether it's in an office space, in a hospital, in a classroom, uh, or out on a good night on the town. Lighting is going to be affected, uh, lighting is affecting uh, that experience of the human. And uh, to the best we can, I think we should control that. Let, let's talk about this, and Gary, let me turn it over to you for a second. Because um, we've heard a couple of things come out on the table. One, we've heard about uh, I'm going to lump a couple things that you said, Vivian, in, under the category of tying it into nature, biophilia and other sorts of ideas. We've also had an introduction on this side of the table to questions about controls. Those are, I would think that those are kind of two, two elements in a toolkit, right? If you've got nature and you've got controls, are there any other elements in the toolkit that, that you think are really, that should be brought forward as part of the discussion right now, or are those the real critical issues? Well, the, I mean, the design of the architectural envelope also ties into this too, right? Because you can't just um, kind of come in with a lighting design solution or a control solution at the end of a project. You kind of need to think about things more holistically. Mm -hmm. So if we, if we want to have um, indirect lighting in a space, for example, well, we need to kind of plan for that. A lot of projects um, have open ceiling designs now. A lot of architects like to have black ceilings. You know, paint, paint that black, have it be really stark, and you know, that, that's a design concept. But it's an aesthetic concept that comes in very early in the project. If we don't get the chance to kind of comment on that early, um, we lose an opportunity to have you know, things like indirect lighting. Or uh, it also ties into daylighting. Daylighting works best when you have a surface to bounce light off of and back down again. So um, how architects and interior designers design spaces, you know, it's not, it has to be a holistic solution, not just a lighting solution that comes in at the end. Yeah, I mean, daylighting design is, is hard, let's be honest, right? Daylighting, daylighting is the most powerful light source we have that we deal with, um, but it's worth it, right? It's, it's just because something's difficult doesn't mean we should ignore it. We should embrace it. We should understand the dynamic nature of daylight. We should understand how we can design lighting systems, daylighting systems to control for glare, yet give us the access to natural light and access to views, access to nature, biophilia, and all the benefits that come with it. So, um, and, and the lighting community, to be honest, they are the best equipped to deal with this, right? We understand glare, we understand human factors, we understand uh, optics, and, and so this is a time where we should be able to pull this expertise into our lighting projects and utilize daylight more effectively. The views are so important. Uh, that's what you get that, that's always the top on the list of, you know, out of these 30 items, check the ones that are most important to you as an office worker or someone in this space, and the views are always among the top two or three. There's so much good technology out there in glazings, and uh, we, we know that you can, you can bring interior, even exterior shading materials into play and automatically make adjustments throughout the day. It can behave in the way you would need it to for the environment and still maintain those views. For years, uh, that I've been practicing at least, we've sort of felt that controls, lighting controls, are sort of the fourth dimension of design. And in that, you don't have to create static environments. Even if they're fully enclosed, uh, you have the opportunity to use control to uh, change the environment. And control is really almost a, the breathing that the, that the lighting does in that effect, uh, whether it changes in character or intensity or direction or even spectral 
a composition. Those are all elements we can now control. And I think in the future, if we could fast forward 20 years from now, and I'll probably still be practicing because I just love doing this stuff. Uh, it, we talked about co uh, color temperature changing, or color tuning as it's often called, white tuning. I think the future is really in how one manipulates spectrum. Because you can do white tuning and end up with really crummy lighting. Uh, color, uh, color rendering or a bias in the spectrum. You have to know what's happening when you do that. And frankly, most uh, manufacturers right now are just doing it by simply having, well, I've got a warm source, uh, normally LED and a, a cool source, and I'm just going to mix those together. What do you like? And that's ultimately, that's not the way to do tuning of white, tuning of light. It needs to be done at the spectral level. And uh, if you're in a retail I in environment, that might mean does that sweater jump off the, the shelf at people who walk by? Uh, so th w w these tools, are we're just getting them sharpened up. That being the case, um, now we have to, have to whereas we used to look at finishes under a single color temperature. We knew we'd have 3,500K light in a space, for example. We'd take our finished palette and, and hopefully put it under that same light source to make sure everything, everything actually looked right. Now, you know, the industry has to actually adapt to that. We have to train interior designers and architects maybe a little bit differently. Um, finished palettes would have to actually work with a wider, um, wider variety of color temperatures. Yeah, let, me, let me jump in because I think there's some interesting points here about uh, the, the color rendition index is independent of the color temperatures, right? And the question is how healthy do the objects that we see on a daily life, including the people that we're talking to, and the, and the flowers that are on the, on the table, uh, how healthy do they look, how rich do they look, is, becomes an important part of the emotional um, well-being of the, of the occupants of a building. And so I think selecting the lamp for its color rendition index, getting as high as possible, as close to 100 as you can get, and then allowing for the, 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 the tuning or the dimming and all the other variabilities that you can buy through, especially with LEDs today, you can, it's, it's less than $30 a fixture to provide IP addressable dimmable uh, light sources. This is, this is a huge leap in, in, the, in the lighting world that has allowed us to do much more customized design. The problem has been that we've taken the controls away from the end users. So I've done a lot of POE in, in large federal buildings. They'll have beautifully uh, you know, uh, capable light fixtures that are essentially on a big switch. Right, it's a big digital switch, but it's a big switch, and you have to call on the phone and say, "Could you dim that light a little bit?" And you know, it, and so, and there's a little bit of perimeter dimming, but there's inadequate give back to the occupant. And I think we're at a threshold now where home innovation is going to essentially swamp commercial building innovation. When we get used to being able to set a scene by just talking to the wall in our living room, saying, oh, I want this to be very romantic lighting, and then lo and behold, it's romantic lighting, right? I've seen, the, uh, you were mentioning the cost of these controls evolving. I've seen this 15 years ago. We didn't even offer these controls to our clients because they were completely unaffordable, or they, were, they make no sense. <laughs> Right now, as the, these technology gadgets have been uh, uh, getting cheaper, I believe these controls have been, uh, are not affordable for everyone. They, they see the benefits of getting that just for the initial investment and also for the control and uh, the, the cost of the maintenance and the operation of the whole building or the whole offices. So that's certainly been a great change in the industry. Has anybody been able to measure, or have you all looked into whether or not uh, worker retention or the ability to attract employees has been um, in any way affected by this or improved that's a great, by this? Great question, Rick. Yes, we see that uh, one of the key facts when you design a, an office uh, is that you have to get them engaged. You have to get in, into a great work environment. You have all ranges of ages there. So you want to retain uh, a very senior guy, and you want to retain these millennials. And so you need to understand the DNA of, the, of, the, of each company in order to get uh, uh, new people into the company and preserve the, the current employees. As someone who's working on, the, or two of you who are working on the design side of this on a regular basis, how are you approaching this issue of, of, of smart technology and, and the end user or the user? I, I mostly work with um, end users, some, sometimes people on the development side as well, but with uh, essentially you know, more the, the end user client. 
So they're very often very willing to invest in um, advanced control, so smart buildings, like after the fact. Like they're, they're inheriting an existing building, um, and they're willing to invest that money to improve it. Uh, but I think one of the things that they're interested in, I mean, they want to give um, their employees more control over their environments, but they're also interested in the data that's being generated by um, smart building systems. So they're interested in using that for um, tracking occupancy, for example, because they want to be able to dial in, well, how do I use my real estate? Um, are people using the huddle rooms as much as we would like them to? Are the conference rooms only being utilized for 50% of the time? Can we scale that back and turn that into workspace? So that they're very interested in it from a, it's just a good investment, right? They, they're, they're willing to pay for that. And they're willing to pay for it, but do you think they understand, and, and what do we do to help them understand that a device like lighting controls can actually have a direct impact on their flexibility for the, from the real estate utilization side? Do you, do you, is it a hard thing to sell to them? It's like, yes, that space can change to this because the lighting controls enable Well, that, it. actually, the space is changing is another thing. They're, that's something that most, most of our tech clients in particular, because the, the rate of change is so fast, they need to be able to change, in some cases, workspace into meeting space almost overnight. It, it could be over, over the course of a weekend, someone could come up and put up um, demountable partitions and like essentially completely re redo a space. It's now meeting space. It didn't used to be. Um, so yes, that, that's actually one of the only ways they're able to do that. If they had to rewire everything, they'd never be able to do it that fast. You can only do it with things like addressable controls and uh, other advanced solutions like that that are, that are much more flexible. In the marketplace, um, people often look at, at, at human-centric lighting and smart buildings, and they talk about them almost separately. Are they actually separate? Is, is, is something that's human-centric and smart, are they on top of one another? How do, we, how do we parse those two? How do we come up with a language that enables us to understand smart buildings as something that enhances the capacity for human-centric experience? There is a very significant overlap uh, in, in human-centric and smart. Uh, the, the notion of smart, of course, means that it's controllable and it can be controlled through multiple points of, of input. So it could be you manually trying to control something. It could be a daylight sensor or an occupancy sensor. It could be a calendar. It could be a whole host of, of, of triggers that would actually impact um, the control of that light level. Human-centric implies that we're designing the light to, as you mentioned, to really enhance the health and the well-being and the productivity. And in, in the case of retail and others, the effectiveness, or in the case of schools, uh, the performance of students, and so in each of the buildings, we're looking at whether lighting has a critical impact on, on human health and well-being and, and performance um, at task. So I think uh, it turns out that to do that, we're making light more dynamic because we realize the power of, of daylight, we realize the power of sort of the biophilic component of light, of spectrally tuned light. Um, we're looking at the appropriateness of light levels for the different tasks. Computer tasks are very different needs than paper-based tasks. Uh, so I think we are definitely looking at smartness as one vehicle for achieving human-centric with a very strong overlap. There are certainly things we can do for human-centricity that do not require smartness. I think naturally, especially all of this having to do with individuals and how it's affecting individuals, brings us back to that, quest, that, that title that we started with, human-centric. These are, these are lighting issues that are tied to you, not necessarily the group. And we've talked a lot about technology, and we've talked a lot about uh, user interface of that technology. What are some of the futures that, that you see, the potential futures you see in, in the area of human-centric lighting as it develops? And not just that technology will get better. We, we do understand that, or at least we hope we understand that. But what are some of the other implications for this from a real estate perspective, for instance, or from an academic perspective, for instance? Well, it's a, it's a tough question because there might be some companies in the future that we are not aware that they'll be invented. So we need to evolve as time comes along. We need to seek for new technologies. We need to seek for new inventions, that's for sure. We need to rely on specialists, on researchers, on um, and designers, in order to, to achieve what's coming on. When you go to a doctor, you don't tell the doctor, hey, I feel, I, need, I think I need to do this and that. The, the doctor just tells you what to do. It's the same thing with these research and designers. 
they are specialists, you should follow them, not try to reinvent the wheel. So what I see here is that we should be continue studying, researching, and get the best result for our future clients, which, by the way, we don't know who they're going to be. Yeah. A couple of points. You mentioned research. It's so fundamental. Uh, several of my colleagues have a phrase they use. This is not a new phrase. First, do no harm. And there's so much information out there. Well, let's light all the, let's light control rooms in, in blue light because it'll keep people awake overnight. Let's do this, let's do that. Just because we know some of these things, we, there's a lot of work yet to be done in research. It doesn't mean we, we should ignore what's out there. It just means we need to be um, careful in the way we apply it and use it as professionals, whether we're designing, whether we're building equipment to support those environments, uh, whether we're making decisions about what to recommend to our clients uh, coming into a building or building a building. So I think that's a, an important piece. And on that note, I think I want to thank everybody around the table for a great conversation today. Um, uh, de nada. Uh, it, was, it was a pleasure to have each of your perspectives um, uh, on the panel, and um, I think that uh, it's, I think it should be pretty clear to anybody watching that this is a very fast moving, fast developing area of both research and practice. Uh, and um, staying current with it isn't only an interesting technological change as it might be in some new building material, but this is something that applies directly to the things we all do every single day and hence wears that moniker of human-centric. So thanks for helping to bring it right back to the human today and we appreciate your time. Super. This is great. Thank you. Great. Yeah, it was